Mike was always very keen on the importance of being earnest. He'd always wanted to play Algy. And he knew that the rights had to be bought on a certain date. And he was under contract to Associated British at this time. And Robert Clark was the head boy of the whole thing. And so Michael rang Robert up and said, the importance is going to be free to be done as a film. Uh, and uh, would you step in on such and such a date early in the morning before anybody else uh, gets hold of it and buy the rights? And Robert Clark then didn't want to do it himself, but he sold it on to Rank and he sold it with Michael to play Algy. I was summoned to Anthony Asquith's office and I remember having to read. And I, I remember that whole interview with him very vividly. And then I had to do a film test. And I remember that incredibly vividly. I looked absolutely ghastly. And uh, Anthony asked with Puff, he was called Puffin, you know, for people who knew him. Um, Puffin was very nice and kept on trying to sort of relax me. And uh, it was dreadful. I mean, it was a disaster. And he was so surprised that it was so awful that he gave me a second test, which was unbelievably good of him and incredibly lucky for me. And the second test was quite different. I wore different clothes and different makeup, and um, he decided um, that I would um, be all right for the part. The film was 21-year-old Dorothy Tootin's screen debut, and she had a lot to learn. My first day on the set was such a shock because we started off with the first scene, with Cecily coming on, meeting Algernon. Yes. You are my little cousin Cecily, I'm sure. And we went on and did about four minutes. I got to ask him to do another take, and Puffin said, now listen, do you realize, well, he actually got the producer to come forward and talk to me, do you realize how much it costs? Um, to do each take, and I said, no, does it cost anything? And he said, well, yes, it costs 200 pounds a minute. And I sort of shut up after that. <laughs> but I think it took me a long time to accept what I would be delighted now, um, that Puffin was confident, and if he was pleased, then I should have stopped getting so fussed and so worrying, you know, I mean, he, he knew what he was doing and he knew what he wanted. And he was a darling man, highly sensitive. And I was just going sort of bananas, sort of just, I think I, I couldn't bear to think that it was being put in print forever and ever, just like that, just like that. No, it was too much. Do you really keep a diary? I'd give anything to see it. May I? Oh, no. You see, it is simply a very young girl's record of her own thoughts and impressions, and consequently meant for publication. Well, I love doing the diary scene with him, because, in a sense, it's a terribly difficult scene for Algy. It, it's because he's got to adapt to this idiotic girl with her three-volume diary, and she can play it perfectly seriously, but he has to uh, play it seriously, being highly amused underneath. And I thought he kept the lightness and the kind of uh, amusement and equally the, the tenderness in that scene beautifully. And he, he played it, he, it made it so easy to play with him. But was our engagement broken off? Of course it was. On the 22nd of last March, you can see the entry if you like. Today I broke off my engagement with Ernest. I feel it is better to do so. The weather still continues charming. But why on earth did you break it off? What had I done? I had done nothing at all. Cecily, I'm very much hurt indeed that you broke it off, particularly when the weather was so charming. But it would hardly have been a really serious engagement if it hadn't been broken off at least once. But I forgave you before the week was out. What a perfect angel you are. You won't ever break off our engagement again, will you? So very different in style and manner, and sometimes you get Algernon and Jack, and they are too similar, and it doesn't work. The contrast of those two actors was just marvellous, and the balance oh, of them. Pleasure. And um, both of them out? had charm, mean, but in a completely there? different way. What on earth do you do there? When one is in town, one amuses oneself. When one is in the country, one amuses other people. And who are the people you amuse? Oh, 
neighbours, neighbours. Got nice neighbours in your part of Shropshire? Perfectly horrid. Never speak to them. I immensely must amuse them. Shropshire is your county, is it not? Shropshire? Mm, yes, of course. By the way, Gwendolyn is in town, isn't she? She is. In fact, she's having tea with me this afternoon. How perfectly delightful. And so is Aunt Augusta. Michael Dennison was rewarded for his efforts in bringing the play to the screen, not only by critical praise for his portrayal of Algernon, but also with lifetime friendships. And he loved acting with Dorothy Tootin. They became friends. They used to call each other cousin, cuz. They st still, at the end of his life, uh, she used to send a Christmas card saying, from your cuz. Well, Michael Dennison was absolutely uh, delightful. Uh, he, he couldn't have been nicer. He, he was so, um, oh, just, he just treated me like a, an ordinary fellow actor. And he was very, very kind and very helpful. And um, sort of, he jollied me along, really. <laughs> As I said, I was in rather a nervous state. Michael Dennison also formed another great friendship with co-star Joan Greenwood. She played Gwendolyn, a society belle in love with the name of Ernest. The husky-voiced actress had already endeared herself to the public in Kind Hearts and Coronets and The Man in the White Suit. She wrote him a little letter, which he loved as much after it was all over, saying, oh, Michael, I did love acting with you. And she didn't put an H on the O. It was just, oh, Michael, it was just typical of Joan with that gravelly voice to, to sort of think of an O as like that. I adored Joan Greenwood. Um, it was just, uh, it was wonderful to see her performance because um, when I saw her on the set, she was very, very quiet, very contained, as you remember. But when I saw it on the screen, I think it was absolutely wonderful what she did with that part. Dearest Gwendolyn, there is no reason why I should make a secret of it to you. Our little county newspaper is sure to chronicle the fact next week. Mr. Ernest Worthing and I are engaged to be married. My darling Cecily, I think there must be some slight error. Mr. Ernest Worthing is engaged to me. The announcement will appear in the morning post on Saturday, at the latest. I am afraid you must be under some misconception. Ernest proposed to me exactly ten minutes ago. It is certainly very curious, for he asked me to be his wife yesterday afternoon at 5.30. If you would care to verify the incident, pray do so. Oh, I suppose there's the one, you know, which she says to Gwendolyn, when I see a spade, I call it a spade. And uh, you think that's going to be the end of the conversation, and Gwendolyn has this wonderful <laughs> line. I am glad to say I have never seen a spade. It is obvious that our social spheres have been widely different. <laughs> it's a wonderful put down. Dame Edith Evans was a very daunting person. And, and I was particularly daunted by her, um, not to begin with, but um, a series of absolute disasters happened. I did an interview uh, for a Saturday paper, evening paper. And I was asked, like, um, I'm telling you now how I got the part. And I said how nervous I was and I had to do a second test. And this idiotic journalist elaborated and said that at my test were Michael Redgrave and Edith Evans, who both thought that I was so talented that they insisted to Puffin Asquith that I had to have a second chance. Well, I mean, it was an absolute lie. Um, nobody else was there. So when I read that, I was absolutely appalled. Anyway, on Monday morning, when we were all there on the set, um, Dame Edith said in a very loud voice, Michael, did you see a certain article about a certain young actress? Did you know anything about it? Did you ever hear of this talented actress we're supposed to be so enthusiastic about? And I could have fallen to the floor. I was so embarrassed. One of Britain's best-loved character actresses, Margaret Rutherford, was the perfect choice to play Cecily's eccentric governess, Miss Prism, the person who ultimately reveals the mystery of Ernest's background. 
Her blossoming romance with the parish priest, played by Miles Mallison, proved to be one of the comic highlights of the film. But is a man not equally attractive when married? Oh, no married man is ever attractive, except to his wife. And often I've been told not even to her. Well, doesn't that depend upon the intellectual sympathies of the woman? Maturity can always be depended on. Ripeness can be trusted. Young women are green. I spoke horticulturally. My metaphor was drawn from fruits. <laughs> she was extraordinary, whereas in a way, only in a way, Edith was cerebral. Um, Margaret, I don't think, was at all. She, it, it was pure instinct. She's a magical person. She's a magical, was a magical actress. And um, I was just so, I, I sort of adored her. She was like a fairy godmother. And she was so, she was another person that was so kind and sweet. She was lovely. And her first scene, when she finds the, um, the handbag, the way she did that scene was just, she did it in one take, then they had to do a retake, and she did it all over again with exactly the same intensity and emotion, which I thought could only happen once. The plain facts of the case are these. On the morning of the day you mention, a day that is forever branded on my memory, I prepared as usual to take the baby out in its perambulator. I had also with me a somewhat old but capacious handbag in which I had intended to place the manuscript of a work of fiction that I had written during my few unoccupied hours. In a moment of mental abstraction for which I never can forgive myself, I deposited the manuscript in the bassinet and placed the baby in the handbag. I was so lucky because I was with all these wonderful actors who didn't seem to have any problem with the style at all. They, they all did it differently. That's what I thought was so good. You, you don't get through that film, everybody talking the same. Everybody talks differently, but they all talk uh, the, the wilder material beautifully and sort of effortlessly, but with the right style. They all gave remarkable performances. I mean, there wasn't a single person who didn't give one of the performances of their lives.